OK, let's see if this one works. Good. OK, so uh, thank you for the organizers that left uh, for inviting me. And um, no, no, David is here. So thank you, David, for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, I'm going to talk about a method that we have uh, developed recently uh, to simulate time dependent transport in uh, open quantum systems. This is not a material science uh, talk. This is more of a uh, method development in, in uh, uh, quantum mechanics or, or uh, quantum dynamics. And uh, I'm, in order for me not to forget the people to uh, uh, mention the people who I work with on that, uh, Tami Zelovich, uh, a joint student of me and Lior Kronik from the Weizmann Institute, Tamar Zeidman, who you all know from uh, Northwestern University, who is actually now in Israel, uh, and uh, uh, many other people who have uh, I've been working on and discussing some of these uh, important issues. Um, all of them are working in the field of molecular electronics and uh, simulations of molecular electronics. So uh, the outline is going to be as follows. I'm going to give you a motivation. Why am I, even though you're from Northwestern, then you don't need a motivation for molecular electronics. I'm still going to give a very short motivation of why am I interested in this. Uh, I'm going to present the microcanonical approach by Max de Ventra. Then I'm going to uh, show an extension of that, which I call the driven Louville von Neumann approach. Uh, and then I'm going to show our contribution to this field, which I call the site-to-state transformation. Uh, this will become clearer very soon. Uh, and then I'm going to use this transformation on both methods to show you how it can augment them and make them even better. And if I have time, which I probably won't, I'm going to show you some new results on coupling bands in such systems. So uh, the uh, very short motivation is going to be as follows. Why molecular electronics? Or what is the promise of molecular electronics? And this has been around for already almost 20 years, I guess. Uh, they are small, so you can uh, miniature devices. Uh, you have identical core components. So molecule, molecules are identical if you create them in an identical manner. So this should give you some device reproducibility. Uh, they are quantum mechanical, so you get some very nice uh, uh, device functionality out of them, different than regular electronics. Uh, Short time scale can provide fast device response. They are highly sensitive, very small, therefore highly sensitive, so you can uh, get very nice controllability. Uh, they consume low power, so it can give you a low power consumption device. They, are self they can self-assemble, so it, it can help in production. Of course, all this is the promise. We're still far away from there today. And they're interesting, and I don't think that curiosity-driven science is a curse. We can do stuff that is interesting and not technologically applicable even. Uh, why electron dynamics? Uh, but because we can simulate time-dependent bias voltages, AC currents, etc. Uh, there is a, uh, the possibility to simulate interaction with time-dependent electromagnetic fields, which is also very important if you want to control them using external fields, time-dependent thermal gradients. So if you think of a thermoelectric device and you can uh, put on it a, a time-dependent thermal gradient, then this can be important. Uh, transient dynamics is important in such systems. You can simulate coupled ele electron uh, nuclear quantum dynamics, which is important. You can uh, explicitly treat excited state dynamics, which is very important in this type of systems. And it is interesting. And again, I don't think it's a curse to do stuff which is interesting. So dynamics is important. What is the challenge? The general challenge that we want to tackle is to simulate electron dynamics in an open quantum system. This is a big challenge. We cannot tackle all of it. More specifically, we would like to talk about time-dependent transport in molecular electronics junctions. So in principle, we need to simulate an infinite system. We have a inf semi-infinite lead on one side, a semi-infinite lead on the other side, and a molecule somewhere in between. And we want to simulate that. This is a little problematic for us. We cannot uh, simulate infinite systems. Therefore, we, in practice, use finite model systems. And for that, we have to put in the correct boundary conditions in order to uh, effectively open the system. And this is a big challenge. So what I'm going to show you first is the microcanonical approach by Max de Ventra. And Roy Van Voorhis has been working on a similar approach. Here you really treat a finite system. And what do you do? You take a system which has a left lead, a right lead, and a molecule in between, and it's finite. Then you put an electric field on it on one side, and then you get some charge polarization, minus on one side and plus on the other side. What then you do is you switch off the field, and you get some discharge of your system. And when you get this discharge, you solve the uh, time-dependent Schrodinger equation in the density matrix formulation. So it's just the time-dependent Leville von Neumann equation. And at a certain point, you get what they call a quasi-steady state. And I'm going to show you what it is in a minute. <coughs> 
The problem is that eventually you get reflections from the edges and then you get a recharge of your system and this is already a problem of the closed system and this cannot simulate an open system. So this is the main problem over here. So here's an example by the paper from already 2005 from Max <laughs> and co-workers. You see here the current versus time for such a system where you start with a polarized state and you discharge it. So you get some initial dynamics here and then you get the quasi-steady state. So here you see clearly what the quasi-steady sta state is. You can see that there is a steady state current here, but eventually you get reflections and you get an inversion of your current. And this is a little problematic because here you cannot already simulate the open quantum system truly. Okay, so what is good about it? It's a closed system, so it's simple and intuitive. Even I can understand it and, and can relate to it. You get the exact dynamics. Everything that needs to be conserved is conserved. Energy is conserved. Number of particles is conserved. Everything is nice uh, about that. The disadvantages, you get the edge reflections. So this can only help you simulate short time scales and not long time scales of your open quantum systems. And this is a, a very, very important problem here. If you understand this, then you understand the whole talk. The boundary conditions here are wrong. So there are no boundary conditions, but the initial conditions, they do not simulate the true a state that you would like to simulate. You have a discharge of a capacitor where in a molecular electronic junction you have a left lead which has a chemical potential and a Fermi Dirac distribution, an equilibrium Fermi Dirac distribution on one side and you have a right lead which has its own chemical potential, temperature and Fermi Dirac distribution on the other side. This is completely different from a capacitor discharging. And this is a huge problem here because the boundary conditions or the initial conditions in this case are wrong. Okay? And we would like to treat that. And it is limited to two terminal devices, but this is less important. Okay, <laughs> so what I'm going to show you is a partial solution of the boundary condition for this system, and this is not ours yet. Okay, so this is a work done by uh, these guys, Todor, Chavada, Todor, and, co and co-workers. And what they did, they took exactly the same setup of a finite system with a left lead, a right lead, and an extended molecule. They start with exactly the same initial conditions, okay? So they put an electric field and they have a charge imbalance between the two uh, edges of, your, of their system. They solve the Louisville von Neumann equation just like before, but they add two terms to it. One term is a damping term. You see the minus sign here? This, this means that this is damping. And what does it damp? It damp electrons or electron density that go into the lead. So this prevents the reflection. So if an electron goes into the lead, it is absorbed. This is just like an absorbing boundary condition in your system. But they had also a driving term. What is this driving term? The plus sign here, uh, <coughs> it signifies that this is a driving term. And this one injects electron into, electrons into the system. But what is the distribution of these electrons? This is the distribution of the electrons that are injected. This is just the density of the electrons in the initial condition. So this encodes the charge separation in the initial state. So basically, you absorb electrons outgoing, and you uh, emit electrons into the system. And when you do that, you can do the same type of calculation like you did before. So current versus time. Let's just focus on one of them. These are just different cases. And you can see initial dynamics and then a steady state. This time, this is a true steady state. This is not a quasi one. This will stay as long as you run your simulation. So this is a stable one. So this is nice. So let's try to compare these two for the time being. First of all, both of them can treat atomistic model systems. This is what I like to do. I like atoms. I like looking at the material like we've seen in the previous two talks. So these can treat both atomistic, uh, atomistic systems. This one conserves everything, the microcanonical, because it's exact dynamics. Here you added two phenomenological uh, terms into your equation. This starts making some trouble. So you can break n representability and density matrix positivity. In simple words, you can get a minus density, a negative density and you can get more than one particle per state in your simulation. And this is kind of, mm, so you break Pauli, Pauli's exclusion principle, or you can get a negative number of particles. This is kind of not nice. Usually the deviations are small, but mm, we don't like it too much. OK, here you can get a true steady state where you add those terms, but here you cannot. So this is a disadvantage of this one. Neither of them have the correct boundary conditions, right? Both of them simulate the edges as a charge, ca charge capacitor and not as a true equilibrium state of your lead. So both of them have no definition of the bias voltage nor definition of the uh, electronic temperature. Let's leave this aside. So basically, the boundary conditions are wrong in both. And we would like to fix that. How can we do that? 
Uh, yes, here we are. So this is a method developed by Abe Nitzan here uh, at Tel Aviv University and Joe Sobotnik and co-workers. And they did exactly the same thing, but in a different representation. So if I look at a molecular junction like a set of atoms, they look at a molecular junction like a set of states. So here you have the eigenstates of the left lead, the eigenstates of the right lead, the eigenstates of the molecules, and they are all coupled between them with various couplings. Now when you look at a system like that, you can solve exactly the same equation as before, but now the density of the injected electrons can be taken as such that it occupies the Fermi-Dirac distribution of the leads, the exact equilibrium one that you would like. So in this representation, you can get the correct boundary conditions, which is nice, and this is exactly what they did. Let me just skip on that. The target density is just Fermi-Dirac distribution. Not as before, it's not a charge capacitor anymore. It's a true equilibrium distribution of the leads, which is nice. But what is the problem here? So here is the method by Abe Nitzan, which is exactly like this, but in a different representation. Now let's compare. First of all, we have a true steady state, just like before, because we add those driving and damping terms. On top of that, now we have a good definition of the bias voltage, which is kind of nice. We also have a good definition of the electronic temperature. We can treat any type of molecular junction because we don't really have a geometry here. We don't have atoms, we have states. So you can add as much of them as you would like in your model. The problem is you cannot really treat atomistic systems. We get the states, we get some model for the couplings, but how does that correspond to a real junction, to a real material? We don't know that. And you still remain, because you solve the same equation, you still have those problems of negative charges or more than one charges per state. So what we would like to do, so you see the boundary conditions are good now, but now we get some bad points here. So there's some trade-off here. Can we solve this? Can we try to use this system but treat atomistic models? And this is where we come in, okay? So this is the site to state transformation that we have come up with. So in the real space, the way I like to look at molecular junctions, you have a left lead, right lead, and a molecule, and all of them are con constructed from various atoms. And you have your Hamiltonian matrix with a left lead Hamiltonian, right lead Hamiltonian, extended molecule Hamiltonian, or let's say molecular Hamiltonian, all the couplings between them. In what Abe likes to, and how Abe likes to look at a molecular junction, you have states coupled between them, just like before. Again, the Hamiltonian looks very similar. But now this block is just a diagonal block with those eigenstates, the eigen energies on its uh, diagonal. This is a diagonal block with these eigenstates on the diagonal. And this one is diagonal as well, with the eigenstates of the molecule in its diagonal. And all the rest are just the, coupling, the couplings between the various states. Now here I can get good boundary conditions, and here I can treat real systems. So if I can connect between the two of them, I can win best of all worlds. So can I have the two cakes? Uh, can I eat, have two cakes, or how does it go? Can I have a cake? Have a cake? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's why uh, have a cake and eat it too. So why did I say too? Because a friend of mine, Lior, that you've seen here, he always tells, yes, you can do that if you have two cakes. So here are the two cakes that we have. Okay, this is why I was mixed with the two. Okay, so now let's see how can we have those two cakes. This is what we do. So this, are, this is our Hamiltonian representation in real space. Okay. What we do now is we separately diagonalize the blocks of the left lead, the right lead, and the extended molecule. So this is a sub-block, and now this is diagonal with the eigenstates of the left lead on its diagonal. Then we diagonalize the central part, so the molecule, and we diagonalize the right part, which is the uh, right lead. Okay, and now we build a global transformation matrix, which is block diagonal, just like that. And if you use this transformation on the real space Hamiltonian, so this is the real space Hamiltonian, this is this transformation, what you get is this type of matrix, which is diagonal. Here you have the eigenstates of the left lead, the eigenstates of the right lead, and the eigenstates of the extended molecule. So th these are diagonal. And these are just the couplings between them. So with this very simple transformation, we can take a real system and move it into the energy representation. And this is good because now we can actually put in the correct boundary conditions. So let's see if it works. So we start with a microcanonical uh, with a microcanonical uh, uh, simulation. So we take a tight binding chain, just that. This is a chain of atoms, okay? And what we do is we start with a microcanonical uh, uh, calculation, namely we do not inject or absorb electrons at the edges. 
Okay? But we start with the correct boundary conditions. So we move it into energy representation and put in the correct Fermi Dirac distributions on these states. And let's see what happens. This is, we, we measure the current here at the center of this, of this uh, uh, chain, and this is what we get. Again, currents, current versus time. So what you can see, you have initial dynamics, quasi-steady state, current inversion, quasi-steady state, current inversion, etc., etc. So this seems to be working, and now let's look at the electronic occupations. Initially, we have a higher chemical potential of the left lead, a, a lower chemical potential of the right lead. Once we inverse the current, they just switch. You see, green became black, and black became Green. Okay? So this works. We have the correct boundary conditions on the system. Can we now get the true steady state of it? Can we make not a microcanonical approach, but a driven Louisville approach? So we solve almost the same equation as before. We have to add four terms here, which are these terms. I'm not going to dwell into it because I'm already, we're already in coffee break now. I'm sorry about that. But in any case, it's not my fault. But, but, but in any case, you have to add these damping terms, and these are actually the reason why previous results got negative, uh, previous uh, uh, methods got negative charges or more than one particle per state, so breaking all those uh, important rules. So now we add these states and we do the calculation. So we move from this type of simulation, where you have some kind of charge separation at the edges, to this type of calculation where you have the correct Fermi-Dirac distributions at the edges at steady state, but for a real system. And let's see how it works. So this is a little crowded, but still. Current versus time. Black curve is microcanonical. No damping, no driving. So you see, we get what we got before. Now we start switching on this parameter, this damping rate. It looks like a fudge parameter, but it isn't, okay? Let's see what happens. I'm starting with a too low value over here. You see, this is what I get. This is the curve. Now, Landauer result, which is the correct steady state result for the system, is this x sign over here. If I, get a, if I put in a too low uh, driving rate, I get a too low current. Then I increase it by an order of magnitude. I get very nice agreement with the correct result. And also, you see the quasi-steady state and the true steady state match very nicely, which is good. If I take a too high value, it gets a little higher. Then uh, uh, an even higher value, it gets a little lower. And there are explanations for that. Now, let's not dwell into this. In any case, what happens here, if you look carefully, I've changed this damping rate by three orders of magnitude. And the steady state current changed only by probably a factor of one and a half or so, okay? So it's quite stable. But more than that, it's really not a fudge parameter. What is this gamma? This is a damping rate. It should rate an electron. It should absorb an electron, which goes uh, uh, onto the wall and bounces back into the system. So the time scale it has to work in order to absorb this electron is the time scale it takes the electron to bounce back into the system. If you look here at the black curve, this is exactly the time for reversal of current. And if you take this time scale, which is 100, uh, about 100 femtosecond per second in this, type of, in this problem, one over that is the value that we actually match very nicely the correct result. So this is not a fudge parameter anymore. This is a true time scale of your system. So you see we have a method that allows you to do that. So just a few examples that it works, and then I'll summarize because everyone is already tired. So basically I, what I'm showing here is that we can do uh, IV curves with that. So basically you can get the current versus time for various bias voltages, and then you can <coughs> just plot the bias voltage as a function of uh, the current as a function, the steady state current as a function of bias, and compare it to the correct result, the Landauer result, and you get very good agreement, which gives you some kind of uh, uh, confidence in the method. We can do even more than that. We can go for thermoelectrics, okay? So what I'm doing now, I'm going to put uh, no bias voltage on the system, but a higher temperature on one side and a lower temperature on the other side. And this is current versus time again. For the case where there is no temperature gradient in the system, so you see you get a zero steady state current, or when you put a temperature gradient in the system, you get a true steady state, a good steady state. So you can do thermoelectrics with this method. And this is even nicer. You can do multiple lead uh, uh, systems. So this is a uh, T-junction where we put a stronger coupling to the left and to the right, and we put a chemical potential higher here at the upper lead and lower here at the uh, outgoing leads. And uh, you are expecting to see higher current going to left and going to right. And this is exactly what you see, current versus time. So you can see that uh, this is the current in the upper lead. And it splits between the two other arms. And naturally, the sum of these give these at steady state, which is kind of nice. We can do this as well. OK, so if we now compare all of these, with our method, we can treat atomistic models. We get a true steady state. We have a good definition 
of the boundary conditions, unlike before, we can treat any type of system, it doesn't have to be linear, and the bonuses, because we added those terms to the equation, we now conserve and representability and density matrix positivity, so we don't get negative densities or more than one particle per state, which is kind of nice. Okay, I'm going to skip the coupling bands because uh, everyone go, wants to go to even though it's interesting, at least to me. Uh, so I'm going to skip this, and I'm going just to summarize. There we go. So I presented a site-to-state transformation, uh, which I hope you're convinced is powerful in order to calculate electronic transport uh, in molecular junctions in the dynamical regime. Uh, it gives you the correct boundary condition in the system. It reproduces the steady-state lambda or current. We can do thermoelectric effects. We can do multi-lead configurations very easily. And it has the potential to uh, simulate time-dependent effects in electron dynamics in large atomistic molecular junction models. It's kind of a compromise between being very, very accurate and being uh, uh, very, very efficient in your calculation. So to thank, again, the people whom I worked with on that uh, and discussed issues with, uh, some funding for that and you for your attention at this time. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Basically. Has okay. this been work done by others? Well, uh, it, okay. If you if you want to do a, an atomistic simulation, let's say on the DFT level of theory on a very large system, it becomes extremely hard to do that in a dynamical regime. Uh, in principle, we can do that. So uh, we are working on not the semiconducting in between, but we we work on doing a semiconductor lead and stuff like that, so putting in some interesting stuff. So if you have a semiconducting lead, you can start playing with light and getting some well, interesting I, results. I, I have to say, the molecular mm -hmm. with the semiconductor. Yeah, I know, no, I understand yeah. that. So the scale to do it's it, the same, it's, the same it's, the, it's the same physics. It's a much, if you want to get the semiconductor properties of a semiconductor, you have to have a chunk of it, right? And this chunk is quite large for, for doing yeah, simulation. Right. So if you want to go, so this is kind of a practical compromise that allows you to go to much larger systems. It, it may be, yeah, yeah, definitely. In the end, you compared the IV curve. You compared your results with Landau. Yes. What did Landau do? Landauer's approach is a steady state approach. This is an approach where you basically associate the uh, conductance through a system to the transmittance probability of the atom. So basically, you are solving a scattering problem. You are asked if you shoot an electron with a given energy onto the system, what is its transmittance probability? If it's high, conductance is high. If it's low, conductance is low. But this is all only good, all those type of calculations are only good for steady state currents. We want to do dynamics. So what we do is we compare our steady state to the steady state that Landauer calculates, okay? But then this gives us confidence that the methods is okay and now we can start studying dynamics, which is much harder when you use Landauer's approach. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.